Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And on this week's episode, we are actually going to dig into subclasses. But before we do, uh, I wanted to make a little bit of a plug and an announcement for this upcoming weekend uh, to let people know that if you love to watch me suffer through uh, an anime dating sim... Oh, we do. Your wishes are going to be answered yet again, because uh, I have agreed of my own volition, this is all on me, to play uh, Lovers of Ether this Saturday night at 9 Eastern. Hey, if you want to watch me suffer, you, you just pop on by our Twitch channel. Uh, I'm probably going to be in Discord as well, and uh, chatting with some of our friends over there. Hopefully they can give me dating advice. Because <laughs> we all know you need it. When yeah, it's an anime dating sim, I I even when it's a game, I need all, all the advice I can get. So hey, or just life. Yeah, it's great. And uh, hey, you know what? They can start to uh, you know taking bets on who they think is the most lovable anthropomorphic animal <laughs> from Rivals of Ether to date. I hope it's we'll a Bulbasaur. No, well, it was always going to be a Bulbasaur anyway. But uh, anyway, look forward to that. And uh, with that said, I wanted to talk this week a little bit about subclasses. We didn't really ever do an episode on subclasses, did we? I don't think so. We did classes a bit, kind of, yeah. vaguely, I believe. Yeah, we did an episode that was getting classy, so uh, I guess this yeah. is getting subclassy. Um, <laughs> sounds uh, right. Classy on the side, maybe? So, yeah, classy on the side. There's a good one. It's my side well, class. It's my side class. So having gotten a little bit more into to D and D and being able to play that, um, that is a system that definitely does use subclasses. I mean, there uh, there are other systems as well, right? But this is the one you're familiar with. This is the one I'm familiar with, just because it's one I'm playing in actively right now. And and to be fair, the subclasses in D and D are actually just the archetypes for each class, but. They are essentially subclasses, so we're going to use that terminology. I have seen systems that don't use them at all. Like, your your character is your character, and you just build it up as, as Yeah, is. there's a lot of those, too. Subclasses, yeah. D&D 5e added, I think, as a way to differentiate different characters of the same class. That was that was kind of what I was getting, is that, like, when you, when you ding at, like, level 3? I want to say it's level 3 for uh, everyone. Depending on the three. class, yeah, it's 2 or 3, Might usually. be 2 for some of them, but um, that there's, there's a point where you then have to choose a, an archetype or subclass or whatever you want to call yeah. it, and that's, that's when you kind of modify what your character is going to be. Yeah, you basically choose a life path or a class you, yeah. path. You choose a class path. You know that you've gone down this road, but now it branches, and which one of these branches do you want to go down? What type of rogue are you? Right, exactly. Uh, my first question to you, though, is actually just a general question. Do you like that kind of character progression? I do. I wasn't okay. used to it at first because I'm used to more 3.5, for instance, for D&D. Where okay. you just kind of, it, it was a very different system. It was similar, but it was very different because you built up your character's skills, for instance, and feats. So mm. it was really customizable in the way that you could take and pick different feats for different characters. And they would all be built differently, but similarly, because they all had the same progression. Um, right. It was just right. different ways of progressing. It's like mm. you can all level your Skyrim characters up to 50. They are just different in what their skills are by right. 50, depending on how yeah. you play. So I w it was interesting at first, and I do like it. It took a little bit to get used to that difference in how you uh, your skill points work, because there are none in 5e. Um, mm -hmm. Your proficiencies work. And then the lack of feats in 5e is really interesting, but they worked in a lot of that stuff into the classes and the archetypes. Yeah, I do know that, like... Uh... In more recent installments of 5e, though, they've started to put a lot more feats back in that you can use. 
So, uh, so it, it feels like maybe they're having their cake and eating it too, because now you can have feats and you have subclasses, so maybe you get a little bit of everything. Yeah, I was kind of, of hit or miss on it at the beginning, because I was like, okay, I get to play a rogue, or I get to play a monk, and then at a certain point they're like, but what kind? And I'm like, oh no, choices. Now I have to make a choice, and it's going to affect my character forever. Hooray! Yay! And I have seen other systems, and I have played in other systems, uh, Open Legend is the one that springs to mind right now, where basically you just, you make your character, and your character right. is whatever it is, and it, you, can, you can take new abilities and feats as time goes on, yeah. as you level up. I know in, like, Warhammer Fantasy role-playing game, the older editions I played, it was, you start your character as a, uh, a job class, essentially. And then you progress through your job class and the things you take, you take as prerequisites to moving into another job class mm. and it ever branches. So you move from job one to job two to job three to job four, but you can choose different ways of doing it. So mm. depending on how you build your character in that sense, you can go from like a soldier to a veteran soldier to a knight to a uh, cavalier or something like that. Okay. Or you could do completely different ways. You could be like a soldier to a, a marksman to a, you know. There are different ways to branch it, and it depends where you start and where you want to go. You take different right. things to get there. Yeah. That's a totally yeah, yeah. different branching system, though. The, the other thing is, like, I cited Open Legend. Open Legend actually doesn't have classes to begin with. That's true. You so, have subclasses, but no classes. If you don't have classes, you really can't have subclasses. You just have characters with abilities. So it's very open-ended in that way. When we get to subclasses, too, I, I've seen people that multi-class, right? You yes. have one class, and then you move to another one. Yes. But could I just do multiple subclasses? Of the same class? Of the same class. Like, I want to be a monk, but I kind of want to be, a, like, a way of the sun and also a way of a shadow monk. So, I was kind of thinking that, that not that long ago while we were talking about doing this. I was like, I Ooh. wonder if you're allowed to do that. Because I don't know if rules as written let you do that. So, yeah. my take on that is, depending on your dungeon master, you yeah. could argue that I'm a ranger, but I want to learn from a different ranger. So I've gone one path, oh. but I want to find a new teacher to teach me the other path. Mm -hmm. Could I do mm -hmm. that as a multi-class character, gaining new ranks in ranger, but okay. starting at level one and gaining the stuff from the other uh, set? I think the right. only issue there would be well, it's not even really an issue, actually. I was going to say the only issue would be is you'd gain those perks as if you were that level, but that's not true. If you went uh, one you went way of back. ranger and then you went back, it started as a level one ranger of the other right. path, mm -hmm. you would just count your ranger level as the total level of your character. So instead of, say, your ranger three and then you go back to ranger one, you'd still count as a fourth level ranger. Okay. Because um, all your class levels are in Ranger. So I think you could actually right. do that. Like, I don't know if the rules specifically let you, but I don't see an issue with it because it's just your effective class level in Ranger yeah. is all of your levels in both of these uh, archetypes. It feels like we're getting into some crunchy territory here, but that's okay. Because I'm starting to think, like, yeah, what would happen if I was multi-classing and I was literally a Ranger-Ranger hybrid? You so would, I'm honestly, Ranger Rick. Honestly, they did things like this before, I believe. Um, for instance, your uh, animal companion for Rangers before mm -hmm. uh, would count as a druid animal companion of... X levels lower than your oh. ranger level. All right. Um, but you could take things to increase that, for instance. Oh. So I think you could do it. it again, it would just be you are taking uh, your class level. So your ranger four, whatever uh, way, or a monk four, a way of the shadow. And mm -hmm. then you start monk one and you take it the other path that you want to, the path of uh, the elements, way of the elements. So instead of being. Monk four, monk one, you would be total counted as a monk five. Okay. Yeah, because cause what I was trying to figure out is, like, if I imagined, like, I had my monk and I got up to level three and I said, I'm going to be way of shadow. And then I say, but now I'm going to go back. And then when I get to level six of my overall monk level and I choose 
a different subclass, I would just get the starting benefits of each of those subclasses. Yeah, you would get the yeah. benefits of the third level, the uh, beginning stuff of the Way of the Elements monk for that instance, as well as your benefits for the Way of the Shadow. So you wouldn't gain the sixth level benefits for Way of the Shadow, right? because it requires you to be sixth level in that specific archetype. Right. Um, but... but your overall, if it was a general monk thing at sixth level, for instance, like if your flurry of blows increased or your ac or your speed increases at an overall monk level of six yes. and it's not the subclass variant that's doing it you mm. would still get those yeah that's what i was thinking would i still get my my overall monk benefits even yeah. if i'm not getting my subclass because your total level uh is the combined of all your levels and all your levels are still right. technically in monk in monk right and if i remember correctly because i play a monk i think and in, in like sixth level yeah your unarmed damage goes up yeah so, so you'd be a level magical. three level three monk with level six right. monk damage right. and all the special abilities a monk has but you'd only yeah. have the abilities for the archetype you took of being third level in each i would still be like a sixth level monk but i would be like a, a baby starting way of elements and way of shadow monk <laughs> you'd be a sixth level monk but you would not have the benefits of being a sixth level in one in any one of uh, those school yeah. of monk yeah see i i have really never seen that done and i don't know if it's just because the rules start to get a little bit um abstract like because they never really i don't think they ever really described what you would do in that situation i don't as i said i don't think rules is written it's meant to be done that way but i see right. no reason that it can't be done that way for instance if i want to be be a uh an assassin swashbuckling rogue i see no reason you cannot be both an assassin and a swashbuckler <laughs> that would be terrific because you could be an assassin pirate. Yeah, that would be terrific. Yeah. No, I kind of want to be like, maybe I want to be a swashbuckler because I want to be a little bit better in melee. But I also want to be a scout so that I can literally travel across the world in five seconds. Maybe I, mean, I want to do both of those things. I mean, yes. That's something that we might do if we actually had the uh, same class, but different subclasses. Here's the other thing I'm trying to figure out when it comes to subclasses. As far as I can tell, and this is just from my interpretation... There are subclasses that will support the basic function of your class, and then there are ones that kind of diversify from it to give you more versatility. Like, you'll have ones, if you have a fighter class, for instance, like a barbarian, there are going to be some subclasses that make you better at hitting things really hard. There are also other ones that start to almost get you into some spellcasting territory. Yep. Do you see a particular benefit between using your subclass as something to make you more versatile or to really go heavy into uh, into your specified skill set? I think that's actually the point of them. It's to give your character more options. Okay. Whereas a barbarian base wouldn't be able to do some of those things. The barbar the totem barbarian gets these like supernatural abilities based on the totems they have. So you become instead of just a rager who hits things, you become a rager who hits things, but is also empowered by the spirits of the animals that they are, you know, in tune with in nature. Uh, right. On the other side, like the fighter, I believe one of theirs is the uh, eldritch knight. Yes. Where they actually get some magic, and that's mm -hmm. to diversify them, make them more versatile from just being, I hit things with my sword, to being, I hit things with my sword, but I can also throw some spells at these things, and they are not going to expect that. And that's really fun when you mix those things, because it means you don't have to cross-class. You don't have to multi-class to get those abilities. You can still stay straight fighter, for instance, and also have your spell casting in there. It may not be as okay. powerful as a wizard or a sorcerer or a cleric, but it's still a guy wearing heavy or medium armor and wielding a shield and a sword who's like, oh, you're too far away? Fireball. I don't know if, right. if they can actually get those, but fireball. It would be awesome. They should call those Inferno Knights. You know that what? New class. name, new archetype. We got, we're going to make this. Inferno That's an Inferno Knights Inferno Knight. thing. And they're just pyromancers. They're basically they're gonna be praising studied pyromancy. Praising the sun. Yeah, they praise the sun. Congratulations. We already know what your outfit is. Knights of <laughs> Solaria. 
<laughs> Knights of Solaria. <laughs> oh man, you know that that's already a homebrew. If we looked it up, the Knights of Solaria, I'm sure somebody's already homebrewed that. They're probably but... clerics that just, you know, have the sun domain. And there's got to be a thing where like it's a word of power. Like when you when you yell praise the sun, like the sun that's on your chest just jets out a ball of radiant energy. You just cast a daylight sun uh, ca- oh, a daylight spell centered on your chest. Oh, that would act- actually, you know what? With as many times as I seem to end up in like dark cellars, that would be incredibly useful. Daylight's a really powerful light spell. It pretty much obliterates undead. I'm there for that too. Yeah. But I do I do like the idea of having a spell that like makes it seem like the flashlight app on my phone is now a weapon. I mean, Scorching Ray is fire, but yeah, there's other ones that are light-based radiant damage. If yeah. you're in a very flammable area... Oh boy, you, you don't know the half of it. No, I ended up in a cellar that had a bunch of rags uh, attached to the ceiling. Let's just say that Rembrandt is very afraid of street urchins now. Street urchins? Sounds legit. Because apparently they can turn into, like, grotesque monsters when the, uh, when the illusion wears off. They try to eat you. There's something fun to learn. Low light environments are good for me because I'm a shadow monk. Except you glow in the dark. Except I glow in the dark. If I didn't glow in the dark, that would be even more useful. But in low light environments, uh, yeah, shadow step all over the place. Go for it. But no, I didn't need to take that, but I did like the idea of that. That technically makes me a ninja. That's like uh, the ninja yes. class, essentially. You're technically a ninja turtle. I'm a ninja turtle, right? And I only know this because, like, the, the people at Wizards, or at least Jeremy Crawford, had said, like, there's no reason to have a ninja uh, subclass because the way of Shadow Monk was supposed to be that. So that's already basically categorized. Now, on the other hand, if you don't want to diversify out, if you're saying, boy, I love hitting things with a sword really hard, I want to be able to hit harder with them, you could go back to the fighter and you could take, like, Battlemaster. Now you have superiority dice, and so you can use that to just kind of like double down on what you, uh, what you want to do. The thing that I'm uh, curious about is, at least in Dungeons & Dragons, you usually get these around second level, third level. Do you think that that's a good idea that people aren't just getting their subclasses right out of the gate, that they have a little bit of time with their character? Well, I think most people have an idea of where they're going to take their character when they make it. It's it's not usual that you're like, oh, well, I'm going to play a ranger. I don't know what they do after first level, but I'm going to play a ranger. Um, so generally, you kind of have this plan of where you're going to go with the character when you make the character. But I think that not having those at first level means you're still all at level one and two, kind of just the base classes. But some of the abilities that start at level two and level three that you get are also things that you probably don't need at first level, but you probably could have at first level. It's one of those weird areas where there's not a lot of difference between levels 1 and 3, but I don't think it would make much of a difference if you were to say, all right, you get your class specialization at level 1. It's Mm. like, I'm a ranger who's dedicated to, you know, giant slaying, for instance, or I'm a way of the shadow monk. You may not have the abilities for it yet, games i mean you could still consider yourself one i feel like this is the one thing that i think about i kind of picture myself in the writer's room when they're putting this all together for like 5e and they're trying to figure out like how how to implement these subclasses and i wonder if there was a thought process of characters coming in at level one not necessarily knowing what the campaign is going to be like it maybe maybe the gm hasn't specified or the dm in this case has not specified what's happening. They're, maybe they don't know what they're going to get themselves into. They haven't tested the waters yet. The subclasses allow them to kind of modify that if they're not aware, like, like what's coming up. I mean, yeah, you can kind of go, I want to play a monk, and then you kind of see which way it's going, and by level three you're like, all right, this is going that way, so I want to be a... Oh, elements sound good, because we're dealing with elemental stuff, so I could be able to yeah. do elemental jujus and mojos. I love the and jujus and the mojos. Or you might be like, oh, well, we're going to be sneaky. I need to be a sneaky character. Right. Um, so I think it does allow to see where party dynamics are going and mm-hmm. what like you would benefit from being and what yeah. you would like to be to help pull the party in a certain direction, perhaps, right. or fill a vacant spart, uh, part in, in the party. 
Or you might have a rogue who goes, I just kind of want to be a swashbuckler or a scout. And you're like, okay, so we need a stealthy person. Because squat, swashbuckler. Because swashbuckler <laughs> I would love a swashbuckler. Really... All right, well, the swashbuckler isn't really a stealthy rogue, so I'm going to be a stealthy. So I think I think letting it sit till third level does help you with that. And that's that's just the thing that I was like... Going over in my head, like, if we were looking at this from a designer's perspective, would, like, maybe that was the thought process when you, when they were designing that system, that, like, you know, maybe just not putting it right up at the front, because who knows, maybe you don't know who else is going to be in your party, you don't know how big your party's going to be, maybe you don't have a lot of spellcasters, or you, you don't have a lot of, like, front and center fighters, and the versatility of some of those subclasses allows you to kind of like rein in how your how your party is going to form. And definitely, and some yeah. of the classes have a bit better diversity than others. For instance, at least in the base core book, mm. I know druids only had like the two archetypes for them: it's the way of the land, or circle of the land, or circle of the moon. Um, so it's either I'm a spellcasting druid and it's not quite that great, or I'm a shapeshifting druid and I can still cast spells, but I'm also a ferocious animal in combat who has a lot of utility use as well. That wild shape honestly has some of the most versatile usage you can find um, mm. in a class ability. There's only two archetypes for druid. For some reason, I thought that there were there were there. More. I believe were only two in the core player, uh, the player handbook. I'm gonna just look at one thing. This might not have been like a, an official thing, but I think that it might have been added in one of them. Is was the uh, circle of anathema is also listed. I'm not sure. I know in the other books they've added more uh, archetypes to a bunch of the classes. Like warlock gets. Hexblade, for instance, which is a really cool archetype. What does the what does the Hexblade but, do? I don't oh, the Hexblade. The Hexblade is a medium armor wearing melee based warlock. Like a warlock that likes to get down and dirty. Oh, uh, <laughs> the the close combat warlock. I actually have yeah. one. Um, we can use them with Pact of the cha uh, Pact of the Blade. You basically Ooh. summon a weapon that you Ooh. can use. And you're wearing medium armor, which means you can wear breastplates, chain mail, scale mail, things like that. And Ooh. so you get your normal, you know, like, Eldritch Blast and your invocations and your other spell-like abilities and your spell abilities. But you also get to, instead of just being a squishy caster, you get hmm. to be almost tanky with yeah. melee weapons to boot. And their magic. Oh yeah, so you just you just do everything real good. Honestly, uh, it is it is one of my really favorite classes for that yes. reason because the character I had made was actually going to be a warlock paladin multi class, which seems weird, but whatever. Um, yeah, because the Pact of the Blade and his patron and whatnot for the Hexblade meant that he like worshipped a sentient weapon essentially and oh, so okay. the background for my character was that well the sentient weapon isn't bad it's you know a thing and it's just a family thing and it's family line it's all paladins or warlocks dedicated to upholding this certain like rule and this certain kind of code mm. so they got okay. their warlock powers from the sentient weapon but they also had a code of honor and rules dedicated to it so the paladin warlock combination there uh was really lore friendly for it and from that example i get the idea that when you're when you're picking a subclass there was supposed to be some story based element to it like there was a reason why you ended up with that uh subclass or just in your class in general but specifically like when it comes to your subclass that there was like kind of a, a story a reason behind it I know it's not necessary, but it does feel like a focal point for some of the development. It can be. Part of the thing there, too, is like the backgrounds that you make with your character and that you come up with are part of the story to that. So right. if your story includes, you would have been this class with this kind of outlook and aspirations for your archetype. You know, that makes sense. Um, right. But it doesn't have to. Because right. your archetype could be indicative of just things that happen as you play, 
mm-hmm. whereas your background to your character is indicative of your flaws, your ideals, and your personality. Right. And your background is something that you get right out of the gate, so that's just inherent. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's who you were class. before you maybe started adventuring. Yep. Or who you are because you're adventuring. Those are really interesting too. At some point, maybe we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, I'm I feel actually like that's a... what Stories of the Fifth Age was for back when that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, but that's not there anymore. So we got, we got to pick up the slack. Apparently, got to pick up that story slack. When it comes to uh, backgrounds, which uh, yeah, we won't get into really here, but there are actually some mechanics and some functionality to those too. Yeah, usually the backgrounds all have their own specific uh, ability. You get some bonuses. Yeah, yeah their their bonuses to their yeah. skills and languages and tools that you could have. For for instance, mm, but they also yeah. generally had a a keystone ability that you could use in your games that are kind yeah. of like lore friendly, okay, or affected things like uh, forget the name. One of them made it so that when you're in the in the wild, you could scavenge for more and find more berries and water and food. Oh, okay, to like automatically essentially, which we don't need to go into right now. We're talking about subclasses, not backgrounds. But, uh, hey, at some point, maybe we can flesh that out and see the usefulness of it. But when it comes to subclasses, though, something that I've noticed, and maybe this is just because of me, when I got into a system and I was like, okay, I'm going to be playing 5e, I need to understand this, uh, when, I, when I've started looking at different characters, I automatically start looking at subclasses and figuring out what I would want to be out of the gate. Like, that's, like, an immediate thing for me. I start pathing that out. Yeah, that's not that's not just you. That's yeah, okay. not just you, Nathan. <laughs> okay, I figure that's a lot of people. I feel like that is most of the people who are playing D&D. Yeah. Like, even my friend Mallory, who really play like, roleplay heavy, she'll, honestly, she will take and figure out her entire character's progression. Okay. From the get-go. Be like, <laughs> all right. I'm going to be level one this, level two this, three, four, up to whatever level. Like She knows exactly how it's going. She'll plan the entire, all the leveling stuff out for the character ahead of time. Which I totally understand because that's where my mindset goes the second I start thinking of a character. Like, I'll, first, first thing I'll be like, oh, this would be a neat character. Okay, what class would they be? Now what subclass? How would they evolve? What would they take for weapons? What would See, they take for proficiency? Here's the thing. Uh, yeah, I think all of us tend to do this to a point, mm-hmm. but there comes times where, like, with my character, my druid, my Hephaestus, I was pretty sure that his growth was going to go just kind of in this one way, but then an event in the game made me question that. Ah. Uh. Basically, his brother in arms left the party, and so I was at a crossroads, and if we get back to this game, I'm still at this crossroads. Where I wasn't really sure what this loss would do to this character. Yeah. Where he might just continue along the path he was going, Mm -hmm. but without the crutch of that other person there to help curb some of the more ferocious tendencies in his nature. I've mentioned it before, I'm sure. But I was considering that he had a branching option here where he was either just going to keep going druid, or he was going to branch off and get levels in barbarian. Oh, because I see the he's the he's a uh, druid of the moon. So circle yeah. of the moon. So he's a shapeshifter. Yeah. What his flaw was that he is bloodthirsty. That's one of the things that helped us decide that when we figured out, oh, well, maybe he's, he's got this thing where he's like, oh, it's the, the beast within. Mm-hmm. And then we determined, well, what if that beast within is literal in which oh. we went? Oh, well, you know what? He's a lycanthrope, and yeah. he didn't really know it, because, you know, what um, happens. You don't remember that, typically, when you black out. No. It's until you get control over it, then you know it. Yeah. So we went, all right, so he's bloodthirsty. He, he has got this flaw for bloodthirst. He's got mm-hmm. this thing where he's got the beast within, and then we go, he's a lycanthrope. So this totally makes sense for the character to have this. Right. And totally makes sense in-game and in the background for the character. Mm-hmm. And it was also a really fun surprise to the other characters when suddenly I turned into a, a, a albino oh. were-tiger. Were-tiger, yeah. So where that was where that character's background had grown to, 
Like, mm-hmm. I don't really flesh out the full background because things can change. You can decide, oh, well, this makes sense for that to have been a thing. You can figure yeah. out some of your background points as you play for reasons that you get into, which is, I think, really fun because it means you're not coming up with a full 16-page backstory to a character ahead of time. <laughs> your character evolves by how you play them and how you right. determine how they are. So we went from... All right, I'm a druid of the moon. I shapeshift, and it explained why he shapeshift really well because he had lycanthrope blood. He is a were tiger. So it went all right. So he's got this this feral nature. He's already a shapeshifter, already a lycanthrope, and this character that he was leaning heavily on as a friendship and like as a brother and a mentor character mm-hmm. has left the party right. suddenly. I was right. really gripped with. I don't know which way this character is gonna fall. Right. He's either going to. D- really succumb to the aggressive nature that he has harboring inside him Mm. or he's going to keep that you know the thoughts of that person and lessons and just kind of grow into a better person and i was actually really considering going the feral route because i thought it would be more interesting so where my character was all like oh cool druid 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 and then all of a sudden bam i was like oh well it would make sense now if he were to go like a psychotic raging barbarian mm-hmm. at least for a couple levels to get the rage cuz right. that would make sense yeah. so you can plan out your characters but then events but, in the game yeah might affect the choices that you thought were pretty much going to happen no matter what yeah i mean that's going to happen i suppose best laid plans you know you're going to there are going to be external circumstances and at the end of the day, role playing is in many ways a storytelling exercise, so that is going to influence choices. And plot twists are fun. So yeah. what do you mean you're not just Absolutely. a druid? You're also a raging maniac, but that's bloodthirsty. I mean, for for me, uh, right now, it's that like uh, Rembrandt is a, a monk, and he has his quarter staff, and that's like the, his weapon that he was given at Sunscale Temple. So it's the thing that he's used to, and it's the thing that he's good at. But then when we, like, raided this uh, orc camp to save some uh, halfling villagers, we found uh, this Githyanki that I basically smacked to death, because that's what Rembrandt does a lot. And, uh, you know, Dom was like, hey, um, yeah, he has these two, like, really nicely crafted scimitars, and, uh, and you're not really sure, like, what they are, but, you know, if we were to look at it, like, on initial impression, they'd probably be, like, 2d6 plus 3 weapons each. <laughs> and I'm sitting there kind of, like, going, maybe I'm not a Donatello, maybe I'm a Leonardo. <laughs> <laughs> like, Here's but... a question for you, Nathan. Did you yeah. take those swords? Oh, yes, I did definitely oh, take them. I took the swords before oh, I knew what they would be, but I haven't actually found out, like, what their stats are. No, that's fine. That's fine. Are. I just wanted to know if you took the swords. Yeah. No reason. No okay. reason at all, Nathan. Have fun okay. with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did pick them up, so... Yeah, you, you have fun with that down the road with okay. those swords. You keep them. And, right. and enjoy the damage they do. Yay. But I, I'm going to have to ask Dom something later. <laughs> Okay, that sounds fine. <laughs> like, you know, Rembrandt sees things and he picks them up. He has yeah, decided, no, that's like, fine. That's fine. That's de- that's hasn't... what you would do. It's what your character would do. Yeah, he would see something. He, like, not intending to, like, not even knowing if he's going to use them or not. Like, he might say, like, oh, here, somebody who needs a sword <laughs> that's better than yeah, the no, sword you Yeah, no, you just hold on to those and use them. They're good weapons. Okay. You said they do, like, 2d6 plus 3 or something like that. That's That's okay. really good. Oh, yeah, no, that's why I was, I didn't know that when I picked him up, but then he was like, yeah, you can expect that they're probably, or, and I'm like, well, I'll, I guess I'll see what they actually are when I go to a blacksmith and, and have him look at it and actually appraise them. Did you do that yet, or have you not I, done No, that no, no, because we had just finished the combat, so I don't oh, know okay. yet. Um, but the problem, of course, there is that it, two-weapon fighting is not a big thing for monks. <laughs> they can do it. They can, um, but they're really good to... at unarmed combat. Like, unarmed yes. is really their specialty. I mean, so... you can just use one of them. I could, but it feels like they're a set. <laughs> I don't really want to break up the set. Yeah, I haven't really, de- I haven't really decided what I want to do with that. And it always feels like the more I'm, con- I'm, I'm thinking about my combat, the less I feel like a shadow monk in general, <laughs> where I'm stealthy action guy. 
your when you were talking about like your movement toward potentially going to a barbarian, that actually brings me up uh, to a question about subclasses there, because if you were to go down that route, could you imagine a subclass that you picked for your barbarian line to complement? the druid one like would you say like the the totem line for barbarian would make sense for you because it might make sense for your druid background you know that would make sense if it was from a sensical point oh, okay but the way that that was gonna go he would probably have been i think it's the uh in indomitable rager Oh, okay. which, which one of this? He would have been the the pure rage one because that's where that would have stemmed stem from character wise. Oh, okay. If I was going at it from a a perspective of this would be best to benefit my character, mm -hmm. I would definitely probably go with the totems because that makes sense. But where it was honestly from a place of just this feral nature and just this rage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense to me. Like, it makes sense, yeah. like, thematically to do it with the druid, but it makes mm -hmm. more sense thematically with the the feral nature to go with just a rage-induced druid. Uh, okay. Barbarian. You're not necessarily looking at your background, you're really looking at where the character is going. Right. I'm looking at what brought the character to this at that point, and okay. what it is going to do to them. I get you. I so, get you. where it's the, the loss of this companion, and the just this emptiness and just this feral nature inside eating away at him, mm -hmm. there is no choice in like, oh, well, I'm a druid, but this path of nature seems like, you know, something I want to explore. It's just kind of, he de would devolve into that. It wouldn't be like as much a choice as just his natural progression into that state. As an example of a more famous character who's done this, mm -hmm. That you might not be familiar with necessarily. If you say uh, the name, I might. Driss Dowarden. Yeah, the famous Drow was it Ranger or Rogue? Uh, Ranger. Rogue? Ranger. Okay, I was I was gonna say, yeah, Driss Dowarden. Yeah. Neshez Bernan. I th forgot part of his actual last huh? name. It, oh, it was okay. shortened to Dowarden. Yeah, um, I, rem I remember because, that part because Drows. So if you read the original series by mm -hmm. Arya Salvatore. Mm -hmm. Um, the first three books of that, well, the first three in chronological order, not when he wrote them, obviously, because that's mm. the Icewind Dale trilogy. The first three books in that series um, deal with him being a warrior first, a fighter. Then he finds the Onyx Panther uh, figurine, gets that. He goes, I believe, fighter, ranger, and then he goes... A level or two into Barbarian mm. for when he's exiled himself from the drow, but he's mm. still underground and basically fighting for survival. If you look at the Forgotten Realms 3.5 sheet form, he actually is like only three levels of ranger, three or four. It's enough to just have the animal companion. Mm. He's a bunch of levels of, of warrior or, or fighter, rather, and he's got a... Uh, a couple levels in ranger i think he's like 10 level fighter four levels in ranger like two levels in barbarian and then he has his drow character level adjustment which is what they had in 3.5 so he's like a cr18 character he didn't really choose that it's just how he had to survive he became savage in that environment so it was a product oh. of the conditions he was in that he became a barbarian for that not oh, okay. the uh thought process of i'm going to rage i wanted to ask you uh, one other big question about this which is usually a question that we ask when we're talking about something specific in design is what a system without this looks like because there are plenty of examples but uh how would you design if you weren't designing for subclasses like how how would you design a, a class system Knowing that you didn't want to go down specifically a subclass route, what are some other things you could do? I, I think in lieu of the class route system and the archetype system, you could offer different options at different levels. Mm -hmm. So where you would normally get these features, and the, they do do this even without the subclasses in there for yeah. like ranger and stuff. You can choose your your specialization for weapons. Okay. And you can specialize uh, in like 
a bow or two handed weapon or a two one handed weapons, for instance, dual wielding. Yeah. Um. So being and even wizards specialize in different schools of magic. So you could do it that way without doing archetypes and still offering up different choices at the levels without necessarily the label. But that would mean you can mix and match. So you could be like, all right, well, at third level, I want the rogue's assassinate skill. And then at sixth level, I want like the uncanny dodge thing. So I don't take damage from um, any successful saves on traps or whatever. So you could do it like that. Yeah, Uncanny Dodge is uh, great. They actually implemented that in KOTOR, too. Of course, mm-hmm. I think a lot a lot of KOTOR, if you look at it, was based off of D&D anyway. It was. Uh, yeah. KOTOR is based on D&D, uh, probably second edition, maybe? Second uh, or third? It was based on a D6 system, uh, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 So it yeah. wasn't the D20 system, necessarily. It was, it was really based on D&D as the system basis but it was also all the damage was done d6s i I think your um i think your hit dice were still on a 20 yes if you but every other dice that you use is based on a d6 so when you're doing damage with your your lightsaber your blasters it was all d6 yeah yeah and then you would have modifiers but see in that game actually if we go to that game it wasn't so much about like the level that you hit at but you did essentially do you did get specializations mostly by becoming a jedi <laughs> like that was that was one where they said like here's your three archetypes at the beginning you have your um your scout your scoundrel and your soldier well those were essentially classes and then later on you would go into your prestige classes right and your prestige classes in that particular game were what kind of jedi you're gonna be are you gonna be a a sentinel are you gonna be a consular are you gonna be a guardian and and you know again those are essentially like the stealth character the magic user and the the straight out fighter so you could choose to go heavy on, let's say, I was a soldier, so my natural inclination is to become a guardian, because, again, I, I can, like, do force jumps and go and laser sword people from half a, half a mile away. Uh, that would be my natural inclination, but I don't have to. I could also diversify and try something else if I wanted to. And in the second one, they, they went from the basic Jedi classes to specialization classes in Sith and Jedi. I guess the benefit to subclasses is, and I'm sure this is one of the reasons why they wanted to implement it in 5e, is because it does streamline the process a lot. You know, like, level 3 hits and you choose a subclass and then you kind of know where that is going to take your character past that without a lot of minute customization that you would go through at every level. I I can understand that. Because, again, 5e was made to be very accessible. Like yes. it was, yes, it was. It, was. That way. it is. It is very much an easier it, system to get into. But yeah, if you were to look at, like you were mentioning earlier about, like Skyrim, you don't really have classes in to begin with, really. Uh, but as nope, time you're goes just on, the Dovahkiin. Yep. And as time goes on, by doing things, you level up different skills, and then you can just become better in those skills. So that's massive customization, like in minute customization, on the other hand of it. Yeah, but on, on that scale, it's hard to do something like that in tabletop. Mostly because the bookkeeping you'd have to keep for leveling skills in that fashion. Hmm. Uh, as in, using the skill levels the skill. Yeah. The bookkeeping would not be fun. I think we discussed that uh, when we went back to talk about experience, the idea of like how many different experience pools you would need to do in order and it's just kind of it's kind of stupid, actually, at that point, trying to make that happen. Uh, unless you have like a whole lot of like math professors in a room that love this stuff. Math the RPG. Math the RPG. It's from Gravity Falls. Probabilitor. I haven't seen that one, but I'm guessing... Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons. Oh, perfect. I love Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons. They should have just called it, like, Dice and More Dice. Dice, Dice, no. Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons. No, no, what is... No, no, they call it Dice, Dice Revolution. (sighs) (laughs) Just no. You knew I was gonna go there. (laughs) The second you said it. 
You knew. Anyways. Anyway, uh, anyway. final thoughts on, on subclasses? Do you, do you like how they're implemented? Would you prefer different kinds of implementation to develop your character? Or No, I think they're fine. I think they're good. I think they did a good job with them, and they're, they're well done in most cases, with the exception for the off subclass that doesn't work very well, a.k.a. the ranger in the core book, because they had to basically patch that. Basically, the ranger in the player handbook, they went, hey, this is really underpowered, so here's this fix to it for free. Mm-hmm. I think they, they really sent some of the unearthed arcana stuff. They're like, yeah, ranger fixes, here you go. Yeah, at some point, there's a few things that uh, I'm interested that they're bringing back in unearthed arcana, and I'm just wondering how useful they are for the modern system, because I know that they were implemented in earlier ones. That's mostly because at some point I want to play an artificer, and I don't even understand how it works. <laughs> so there's yeah. there's a, there's a lot of and and there, that's gone through a lot of iterations. So I'll I'll be interested to pick your brain at that at some point, but not on this episode. My my thoughts on subclasses is that for for the streamlining of it that they wanted to do for Five E, it seems to make perfect sense. You know, it allows for more customization of your character without being so laborious to try and micromanage it it makes sense for that system but there are plenty of systems especially that just are more freeform where that wouldn't make a lot of sense and so it does depend on what you're building as we always have a tendency to say it depends on the system it does depend on the system i would say that uh, subclasses for D D archetypes make sense for the system that they built uh, in another system, might not, but yes. it's something worth thinking about, especially if you've already put down classes in a system. It's something worth considering how you're going to diversify that class as time goes on. So, uh, Alex, if uh, the folks out there wanted to learn more about our subclasses, where could they go? <laughs> Probably a dictionary yep. or someplace that Nathan goes on to. Yeah. Or you can find us at Delvecast.com. Or Wikipedia. No, you can find us at Delvecast. You can find all of the different subcategories that we have, because we have uh, several different shows that we do over there. And uh, while you're there, why not check out our Patreon? Uh, we have some neat stuff for you, even if you're not a patron to our uh, site. Uh, like some of our new show ideas that we are kicking around right now, you can find more about More Than Meets the Die. There's a couple episodes up there right now. I know Dom is working on another one as we speak. So uh, so go and check that out. See what you think. Uh, and for a whole massive dollar a month, you can actually get all of the uh, extended episodes and uh, additional content that we, we put out there. But make sure to follow us on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify, any place that you get your podcasts. Uh, rate, review, and subscribe. We always appreciate that. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. And so you can get all tw Twittery about it. All, all Twitty. Yes. Twitter. And, uh, and if you have not seen it yet, uh, please go check out our major announcement about Delve Prime. <laughs> or the uh, live episode that will be released shortly after this, uh, where we will talk uh, about some other potential Delve Prime projects that we have that were just so much fun to come up with. And believe me, I made cover art for all of it because I'm that crazy. So again, uh, yeah, Saturday I'm going to be uh, uh, delving into another anime. See what I did there? Uh, I'm going to be delving into another uh, anime-inspired uh, dating sim. I so, see what you did there. Yeah, and you can all enjoy that on the Twitch and everything else, and I'm gonna probably be banging my head against the uh, the desk by the end of that night. But I don't think it's particularly long, so hopefully I'll be able to make it through. In You'll have to play day. it more than once, Nathan. I'll have to play it more than once and see if I get different results. Yep. That's great. I want it, the, the orca whale looked like... Uh, it was especially nice, and uh, a character you'd want to spend Yar, more time with. Lar, Yar, she blows. Yar. <laughs> uh, until we see you next time, thank you for joining us on Delve, and uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.
How do you not want custom delve skins for your favorite Renaissance uh, sculptures? Do you have any Renaissance sculptures? Not that I'm willing to divulge in a public forum.